Good morning. Welcome to the lakes. I am so glad to see you here this morning. If you would, just turn to your neighbors, say hello to them, look around. If you're joining us online, say hello and uh, tell, let us know that you're here. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. You are awesome, holy, good. You are love. Today we breathe in your presence and we say yes to your love. We thank you for uh, Jesus who came and revealed uh, you to us in a perfect way. We thank you for those who have gathered here today to worship you. We thank you that together we are your body. We seek to lift each other up, to encourage one another, and to spur one another on in your kingdom. God, we pray blessing over this body, that we may be a blessing for your kingdom. God, we thank you for this community that you have placed us in. We pray, God, that your kingdom would come more fully here in Wapaka and the surrounding areas because you have a heart for the lost. You have a heart for this community and those who live here. And God, we pray that you would use us to bring the kingdom to them. We pray for breakthrough. We pray for restored relationships. We pray for redemption. We pray for the lost to be found and the hurting to be healed. And God, we pray that this community would serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us here today. Pastor Dean and I have recorded some announcements and We will play them now for your viewing pleasure. (laughs) Oh my goodness, what smells so... Bacon. Bacon. I'm making making bacon. I'll help. I'll make the eggs. So, it's time for the announcements. Uh, Soon, we're going to be celebrating Holy Week because spring has come and is coming. Palm Sunday is March 28th. Excellent. And uh, actually, Pastor Amy and I both will be preaching come. It's going to be an awesome time. Uh, Good Friday is uh, 6.30 p.m. April 2nd. And the resurrection of our Lord Easter Sunday, we are celebrating April 4th. Service is at 10 a.m. We hope to see you, your family, and your friends. So if you desire transformation and to grow in your biblical understanding, then you're invited to the Bible Project Discussion Group. Robin Manson will be leading this on Tuesday evenings, and together you'll dig deep into the Word of God. It's going to be Tuesdays at 6.30, both in person and online via Zoom, starting March 23rd. If you want to uh, ignite the passion for the gospel, on Sunday mornings, we are starting the basics of the gospel. And we will be addressing such things as who is Jesus, what is the gospel, why should, why should uh, uh, I be baptized, and the benefits and the results of the gospel. So... You gain understanding, confidence, connection, friendship, grow in your faith. It'll be a great experience for those who are new to the faith or who are considering a relationship with Jesus and for those who'd like a refresher as well. In addition, it's also for mature believers who have friends and want to know how to talk to those friends about the gospel. Are those eggs ready? Yeah. All right. So... On Sunday mornings uh, at 9 a.m., we're going to be starting this class on uh, the basics of the gospel. But also, at 8.45, we're going to have eggs and bacon. Oh, yeah. So join us March 21st at 9 a.m. for the class. But come early, 8.45, grab a cup of coffee. Child care will be provided. And come and be inspired in your faith. And even if you just come for the bacon and eggs, we'd love to have you. 
So the uh, uh, offering from Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. You know, what we have comes from the Lord anyways. Every good thing, even bacon and eggs, right? It, everything we have. And when we give, that's a way of worship and honor because we love him and we want to uh, honor him with everything all of who we are, including our wealth. And so we encourage you to give and to give generously because it is a form of worship. We love, let's pray. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. We thank you for all the many gifts you've given us, the opportunity to give back. And Lord, uh, we pray for this eggs and bacon right now that Amy and I are about to consume. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it was so good. And you, too, can have bacon and eggs next Sunday morning. Uh, I think well, we're going to be cooking in the kitchen by 8.30, so show up for bacon and eggs and, and the class to follow at 9. We hope to see you there. And don't forget Robin Madsen's class is on Tuesday, too. I know the whole cooking and talking thing was a little distracting. But <laughs> anyways, so there is so much to be thankful for. Every good thing that we have in our life comes from the Father. What good thing have you experienced this week, this morning? If you would, at this time, please stand and share it with someone close to you. If you're joining us online, we want to know what you're thankful for, too. Type it in the comments below.
worship you. You are our King of kings, our Lord of lords, our all in all. We exalt you, Lord. We are so grateful that you are a faithful, a reliable, a trustworthy Lord. You, Jesus, all that you've endured on that cross, that blood that you shed for us to set us free from sin, Yeah. 
love you. We praise you. We glorify, we worship you for who you are. We thank you, Lord. We glorify, we worship you. We give you glory and honor for you are the way, the truth, and the life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God and you don't belong to yourselves? You have been bought and paid for. So honor God with your body. It is uh, God is at work in our physical world. He is working around us, through us, within us. He is working and he desires us to physically be able to see him at work, to open our spiritual eyes that we might join him in the work of the good news of Jesus. And so uh, one of the best ways for us to be able to begin to grasp God at work in the world is to be able to hear it from others as we share a testimony or a word of scripture or a a prayer concern that we have been placed on our heart from the Holy Spirit who resides within us. So uh, Pastor Amy and I are going to be in the back, and uh, during this next song, if you're willing, We'll be back there. We'd love to hear how you see God at work in the world. And uh, we'd in, we'd shepherd you through then the opportunity to share that to encourage the body of Christ here. So join us in the back.
Sandy, you're going to come forward. So. Good morning. So, yep. Okay, sorry. So, um, sometimes in life we go through really dry, stagnant, like dry, stagnant water just sitting there and getting muck on it. And that can happen in Christian lives. And that, that's been my life for a while. <clears throat> and some of you know I have Hashimoto's. I've been going through some health changes. And so I made a conscious effort about six days ago. Well, actually before that. But six days is when I started making healthy uh, food choices. But it streamed over into being able to spend time with others, love others, care about others, and get my eyes off myself. And so I did that yesterday. I spent the day with my mom. She's getting dementia. She's very, she's not even 100 pounds. She's um, very difficult and starting to do a lot of these activities of daily living. And we went through and Moved her birds out of the living room because they're so loud. And uh, redecorated a room. And um, it was a lot of work. But it was like the joy that it gave me for reaching out to her and loving her um, brought us so much closer. And she could not thank me enough. The other triple trickle-down effect was that my sister had came over there. And she was shocked that I did this for mom, and she doesn't normally give me compliments. In fact, we're kind of estranged. But she told my mom, I love her for that. So just little things that we do to be Jesus with skin on to others without preaching at them is enormous. And I felt the impact of that yesterday, and it brought me so much closer to my family than I had been. And so as I get more energy getting healthier, God's going to use me. And I'm grateful. Don't walk away yet. So, so we're going we're gonna to pray for Sandy. Lord, we thank you for her. We thank you for her servant's heart. We thank you for the love that she has for people, for her mom, for her sister. We pray for any reconciliation that needs to happen in the family. And Lord, we pray for your supernatural healing in the name of Jesus from the top of her head to the tips of her toes. Lord, fill her with your Shekinah light, that glorious light that brings healing, wholeness, and restoration to her. Lord, you created her perfectly. We ask that you uh, would bring her back into the form you created her to be in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite Ian. Good morning. Good morning. So my wife and I are going to, sorry, right there. Um, my wife and I are going on a trip uh, that she got through her wonderful job, and um it's been a, a huge blessing to us. Um, the problem is, I couldn't find my passport. Um, we're going to Mexico, so you kind of need that to fly to Mexico. And I looked all over the house, uh, looked in the storage unit, looked in all the files. It's not where it's supposed to be. So I looked through pictures from our last trip to Mexico, and I looked through all of the backpacks that I saw in those photos, and it was not in any of those. <laughs> wasn't hidden in the lining. Um, so I went back to the storage unit, and uh, my buddy Craig came over, and we looked through every single box. And at the end of the day, after eight hours of looking for this passport, uh, we were just kind of dejectedly throwing the boxes back into the storage unit. And Craig goes, what about... Vests and jackets. This one's labeled vests and jackets. Well, I mean, it was winter time. Maybe, 
maybe I stuffed it in a coat pocket or something. So we opened it up, you know, just, just in case. And in my fishing vest, which I, I last wore to see uh, Gary and Cheryl, uh, apparently I had used that when we flew to Florida. And it was in the pocket of my fishing vest, the very last box of the storage unit. Um, so the 99 were not the right ones. The, the last one was the one. And I'm just super grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, God. Amen. <laughs> Lord, we pray for uh, Jess and Ian that they have an awesome trip, a relaxing trip, and we thank you that Jess is glad that Ian did find his passport <laughs> and wants him to go with her. <laughs> Amen. So uh, at this time, we're going to uh, r release the kids uh, for Splash uh, Middle School. And for, uh, we have uh, child care available if you need that. So in years past, I can't remember. There it is. You know, you just have to memorize which direction to switch the little thing. And sometimes I get it mixed up, and then I say embarrassing things, you know, when my microphone is on. That's not good. Anyhow. Um, in years past, I have found it difficult to move children from one place to another. You know, when my kids were younger, they required lots of items that went with them. And I am so grateful that my youngest is five now. I am not joking. I love that. She can buckle her own self in the back seat. It's fantastic. You know, all of the potty and bathroom things are totally, uh, you know, out of my hands now. It's fantastic. But in years past, that wasn't the case. And, uh, you know, just a simple trip to the grocery store or to the park or anywhere to church, you know, it required the diaper bag and it required the car seat. And you can't forget the blanket, the nook, you know, the special toys. Maybe they're going to need a book. And goodness gracious, don't forget the snacks. You know, so by the time that I walk out the house, I am loaded. You know, I've got my arm in the car seat, the diaper bag slung over my shoulder, a kid on the hip, and then you got to find the other two somewhere. You know, they're around here. Let's go. Did you get your shoes on? And if it hats, and oh my goodness. So knowing this is one thing, but then executing it is another thing. So we get one day, I have this uh, memory where I'm like, okay, we're going to do something fun, and we're going to go to the park. And there's something that I realize about my children, and it is this. They don't like to leave the park. Once we're there, we need to stay forever and ever and ever, you know? We have to stay at the park. It doesn't matter if it's raining, if they're freezing to death, if they're starving or they're past their nap time, we need to stay at the park. So thinking ahead, I thought, let's provide some motivation for leaving the park. And so I said to the children, when I say it's time to go, if you all come with great attitudes and get into the car, we'll go get ice cream, right? That should do it. That should do the trick. So we get to the park, you know, we've got all of the things, we're loaded, we, and the kids are playing, having a great time, and the dreaded time comes when it's time to leave the park. And I say to the children, children, it's time to go. And I think they know they're going to get ice cream. This will be a breeze. They will just come and say, yay, it's time to go get ice cream. But of course, that isn't what happened, right? I still get the same, no, we don't want to go just one more slide or just one more whatever, right? And so, you know, you have to practically drag them out of the park, kicking and screaming, and then you, the ones that did come are sad now that we can't get, it's just a mess, you know? It is hard to move from one place to another with small children. But 
The thing is, is it doesn't really change. We don't like to move from one place to another. We don't like moving houses, you know, packing up all of our stuff and learning where the new light switches are at the new place. You know, we don't want to move from this place because we know what this place is like, and it's good here. But God has offered us something. He's called us, the lakes, into a new place. He's called us to move from here to there. He's called us to go outward, to be on mission with him, to reach the lost. And I'm not naive to think naive enough. I mean, I'm pretty naive sometimes. But I'm not naive enough to think that the journey might be difficult. And that it might just be more comfortable over here. But we don't want to stay here. We want to move where God has called us to move because he's got great things in store for us. We want to say yes to him, to going outward and to reaching the lost for him because he's got a kingdom mission for us. We want to see the lost found and the people redeemed. We want to see broken relationships restored and people set free and healed. We want to see our community transformed. And we want to see people who are far away from God draw near to him and to come into a living relationship with him and to live life to the fullest. We want to see that happen. But if, we need, if we're going to see that happen, we've got to move from here and take some steps out. We want to say yes. Jesus is looking for people like us. He's looking for people to join his harvest team. Here's what he says. Matthew chapter 9 says, Jesus traveled throughout all the towns and villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, when he saw the community of Wapaka, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. Church, we are those workers. We are those people. We have been called Outward, we're invited to join Jesus' harvest team. But what do we do now? What's next? How do we step into that? We want to move from here to there. How do we get there? There is this great story in the Gospels. And as a matter of fact, Pastor Dean and I were talking about this week, and he said, okay, which text do we have left to preach for Expedition Outward? And I said, well, we've got, you know, these other ones and Zacchaeus. And he's like, didn't you preach Zacchaeus a couple weeks ago while I was on vacation? He said said that, (laughs) he told you all that I preached Zacchaeus, but I didn't. And so... We're going to talk about it today because it's a great story. And it, it contains some really interesting things that will help us on our journey to becoming harvesters. We're going to study what Jesus did in this text and see what you and I can learn about being on Jesus' harvest team. So here's the story. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus 
there, or he was there, yes. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because of the crowd, or because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Do you know the song? I know you're already thinking it, right? All right, so just wanted to make mention of that. I'm not as brave as Pastor Dean, so we're not singing it. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. That's where we want to end up, right? That's where we want to be. Jesus then continues, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the mission that you and I, the lakes, are invited onto. So how do we get there? How did Jesus get from passing through Jericho to salvation has come to this house today? That's what we're going to take a look at. We can find three things that Jesus did that we can do as good harvesters, and we can uh, start to implement them. Here's what I want to say, though. We, as harvesters, are not responsible for how people respond. We're responsible for being faithful to what God has called us to do. And I also want you to know this, that God loves the people in our community even more than we do. And he's already at work in their lives. So we're going to take those two things and then walk through what Jesus did. So the first thing that Jesus, that we see Jesus doing is he notices Zacchaeus. So picture this. He is in Jericho, big city, think big city, and it says that it's crowded because Jesus is extremely popular. His teachings have spread, his popularity has come into fruition, and everyone wants to see him. So who's somebody that you would like to see, like in real life, on earth, that's living today? Yeah, like really, who would you like to see? Give me some people, someone that you're like, I really want to see that person. If I could go to this concert or meet so-and-so, who would it be? Okay, I don't know who that is. Lauren Daigle. Is he a music? What, what genre? He's a preacher. Preacher, good. All right, I should maybe know that. Who else? <laughs> who else do you want to see? Okay, Clive Cussler. Could you picture a crowd around this person that you would like to see? Could you imagine how many other people want to see that person? And given the opportunity, it might be difficult to get to them, right? This is Jesus, the biggest star of the time. And the crowds all want to see him. But Jesus isn't distracted by the crowds. He's not distracted by their admiration for their clamoring for his teachings or miracles. Instead, Jesus is staying alert to see where his father is working. In the midst of this vast crowd, he finds one guy. He notices God at work in one person because that is where his focus is. He's not distracted by all of the clamorings and the, and the goings-ons of the crowd. He knows that God's at work here somewhere. 
And he's primed and alert to find out where. And so, when he sees Zacchaeus in the tree, he knows what's going on. He knows that that is his person for this time. We're not necessarily called to reach everybody all at once. But we are called to notice where God is at work in the lives of the people around us. And that's what Jesus did. Colossians 4, 5 and 6 says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This is a great passage, and there's so many things here. But I really want to point out to you is the word opportunity. You know, in order for us to take advantage of an opportunity given to us, we have to notice it. We have to see it. Some people are better at seeing opportunities and seizing them than others, right? You know, entrepreneurial mindset. But we all can learn to tune our eyes to see the opportunities that Jesus brings our way. Because we know that God's already at work. So let's become people who notice where he is at work. So what about us? What about you and I? Do we notice where God is at work and around us and the lives of people around us? Or are we fit focused on the things of life, the cares of the world? Are we busy with the here and now so much so that we don't really know where God's at work or we wouldn't notice? We were in a staff meeting earlier this week, and we were talking about what signs we should put up for Easter. And we want to let the, let the community know that we're having Easter services and invite them here. And uh, so one of our staff members said, maybe we should do this type of sign, and another one said, well, maybe we should do this type of sign. And I said, well, we haven't had a banner up in a long time. Maybe we should do a banner. And uh, the Jess, our office assistant, says, there's a banner out there right now. It says, it live streamed services. And I thought, no way. There's no banner out there. I'm pretty sure I remember looking at those empty posts. There's no banner. Well, there's a banner. <laughs> there is a banner. You know, we can go through life not noticing the things around us. Not observe, you know, not being observant. But Jesus was tuned in to where the Father was at work and he noticed Zacchaeus. But that's not all. He also recognized where Zacchaeus was at. He recognized. In spite of the outward appearances, Jesus saw God at work in Zacchaeus. If you and I had been in the crowd that day and we were first century Jews, likely we would have been spitting nails that Jesus noticed Zacchaeus. Maybe we would have been even upset because here's what it, Luke 19 2 says. A man was there by the name Zacchaeus, all right? And here's what Luke records for us about him. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. If I were writing this today, I might say he was a traitor and a fraud. That is what Luke is telling us. A chief tax collector, the Romans were the oppressors of the Jewish people. They'd conquered the land, and now they wanted their due. And so this Jewish man took the side of the Roman oppressors and collected taxes for them. Traitor. That's how his fellow uh, Hebrews would have viewed him. And he was wealthy. 
Now, why does Luke point this out? Well, as a tax collector, the Romans didn't really care how much taxes you collected as long as they got their share. And so the way that tax collectors provided for their own salary was by collecting extra. And so here's a man who not only is working for the oppressors, he's also lining his own pockets with his fellow brethren's income. This guy, not, yeah, this guy, not the most popular guy in town, right? And this is who Jesus notices. And not only notices, but he recognizes where Zacchaeus is at. This is amazing to me. Jesus takes this guy who most of the good Jews of the time would never have associated with at all. And he doesn't judge him by his vocation. Jesus doesn't judge him by his morality the way that he is dressed, his wealth, or his influence. No, Jesus sees God at work in him. Jesus sees a man seeking him. Jesus notices that he climbed a tree, that he ran ahead. Two things that were, you know, socially unacceptable for men of wealth and influence to do at that time. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God wants to be found. God wants to be found. And Jesus recognized that earnestness and that seeking in Zacchaeus as God at work in his life. Jesus was great at recognizing where people were at in their spiritual journeys towards him. And you and I can learn that skill too. Because if we go outward with the assumption that everybody is like Zacchaeus and ready to cross into the kingdom, we will make some mistakes as how we interact with people. But Jesus was good at this. He could recognize where people were on their journey toward seeking him. Not everybody is as near as Zacchaeus was. But as harvesters, we can learn to recognize which leg of the journey people are on. So some people need to move from distrust to trust of a believer. There's people that we will meet and interact with that don't trust Christians at all for one reason or another. And when we, we interact with those kinds of people, we can't be giving them 21 reasons to know Jesus. They don't even trust us. So we would interact with them differently. So some people need to move from distrust to trust. Next, we, they move from complacent to curious. You know, they might trust a believer, but they don't really you know, care to know anything about Jesus. And at some point, they'll move to being more curious, and we interact with a person differently then when they're in that leg of the journey. Or from being closed to change to open to change. You know, they might be curious about who Jesus is, but not ready to change anything in their life. And then they cross a threshold and begin to be willing to step into new things and explore new areas. Or here's where Zacchaeus was. He moved from meandering to actively seeking Jesus. You know, you might be curious and maybe willing to change a few things. Then you move in to seeking who Jesus is. And the next leg of the journey is entering into the kingdom and conversion and bringing your whole self to Jesus. But we need to recognize where people are on their journey and interact with them in that place. That's what Jesus did. He, saw, he noticed Zacchaeus and then he recognized where he was. 
and he joined God at work there. So what about us? Are we able to recognize God at work in other people's lives? Or do we judge them by their appearance, their vocation, their morals? Or are we, like Jesus, able to look past those outward appearances and see where God is working in their life, what part of the journey they're on? So Jesus didn't just notice Zacchaeus and then recognize where he was at in his journey. He then adjusted his plans. In spite of whatever Jesus had planned to do that day, he adjusted to follow God at work at that time. So here's the original opening, right? Luke 19.1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. All right, we are here. And we're not staying. I think that's what passing through means, right? We're going through Jericho. But then Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the tree. And when he reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Come down immediately. Why? I must stay at your house today. Isn't that cool? Jesus here, we see, recorded in the gospel, literally changing his plans because he saw God at work. He was not rigid in his schedule because he knew his mission. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so when he noticed God at work, he stopped and he joined him because it was in line with his mission the entire time. He was ready and willing to set aside his plans because this diversion, right, what, this interruption was according to his mission. It was in line with what he was here to do anyways. So what about us? Do we hold tightly to our schedules as if they belong to us, as if we're in charge of our days? Do we schedule every minute of our day leaving no margin, no room for seeing? You know, uh, here's a confession of mine. You know, I'm in seminary, a mom of four, and I like what I do here as well. My days have little margin. They're full. And that has been wearing on me. How do I... Leave room so that I can take the opportunities when they're presented. You know, sometimes, uh, here, I got a message. My boys need haircuts. Simple, right? And so I mess, you know, I don't know why, but the particular salon that cuts their hair, you know, they don't really answer the phone. So I have to use Instant Messenger to arrange a haircut. So I message and I say, I need a haircut for my boys. And she messages back and says, how about three o'clock on Monday? And I'm like, actually, I have a meeting at four. Don't think that gives me enough time. And then, so she messages back. All right, how about seven o'clock on Monday or all day on Wednesday? And I thought, I think I have a council meeting when Monday night and I have staff meeting Monday or Wednesday morning and the boys have guitar lessons on Wednesday afternoon not going to work. Where's the margin? Where's there room for us to take opportunities when they're presented? Perhaps your schedule isn't as full as mine, and I hope it isn't. But if we have room in our schedules, do we have eyes that are looking? Are we willing to be flexible when a kingdom opportunity presents itself? If we are, God will work through that. What greater joy do we have than joining God on his mission and being harvesters alongside of him? That's our mission on life. That's what we're here for, church. 
We're here to expand the rule and reign of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to bring his glory more and more into fruition in our lives because God has a heart for the world. And he's called us to join him. Will we say yes? Will we notice where he's at work in the world? Where Will we recognize where people are at in their spiritual journey? And will we adjust and join God in his work? I pray we do, for the harvest is plentiful. Let's pray. God, we're so honored that you would work through us. We're so honored that you would call us to be on mission with you, that you would trust us and give us that responsibility, that you would empower us and work alongside of us. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to say yes to you. God, I pray for great things here at the lakes. I pray for kingdom breakthrough in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this time we're about to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. So online, uh, if you, I hope you have what you need necessary. If you don't, there are some uh, right out in the, um, at the entrance. Amy, I'll cut the boy's hair. I, I got it down. I got it down. I can do it. Um, Revelations 3.20, Jesus is speaking. He says, I stand at the door. I'm standing at the door knocking. If anyone, say any, anyone, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and be with them, and I will eat with them, and they will eat with me. As we prepare to celebrate communion, let us reflect on what Jesus has done for us, both us as individuals, who are his beloved, and us as the community of Christ. And now, let us pray uh, what Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I just invite you to open the top and take out the bread. And this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. He loves you. You are the apple of his eye. You are precious in his sight. And he invites you to eat with him. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, broke it, or shared it with those around him, and said, you know, this is my blood the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so, Lord, today we remember you. We thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for your presence here with us at this place, at this time, with Christians around the world as they celebrate this meal. And we thank you for the future and for the victory feast that we will be joined with in the future. I invite you to open the cup. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Now we confess uh, our faith together with Christians around the world. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please rise.
love you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you, King of glory, Lord of love. Now, receive the blessing. I just invite you to put your hands out and as, as a, somebody would to receive something. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, we have prayer triads. If you still have yet to find three people or two people that you want to join with and praying with for those who as of yet do not know Jesus, there's an explanation and you can sign up on the back wall. If you need help uh, finding people, Amy and I would gladly help you. Also, you can pray right now. I invite you to pray. Uh, take the opportunity to pray for those with those around you. Just gather in groups say, hey, what can we pray for you for today and for this week? Jesus loves you, and so go in peace now and serve the Lord.